Hello, this is Tamara Lexo. I'm the Executive Director of Hopeful Hearts Ministry, and I'm here with my dear friend, founder of Hopeful Hearts Ministry, Shannon Barr. Shannon, it feels like it's been forever since we <laughs> have sat down to record together. It has been. I, well, it really, I mean, for us, it has a few been weeks. a very long time. <laughs> I know. I know. It has, it's been a few weeks, but I'm glad to be here with you today, and I'm glad, listeners, that you are with us, or watchers, if you're watching us on YouTube, but it's good to be here. Um, we've got a lot to to talk about today. So, mm -hmm. Shannon, I'm just going to take it over to you because um, sure. you have you have some you've had a lot going on. Yeah, and please forgive me. I've also, on top of everything, had the flu, and then <clears throat> all of that. So, yeah, um, I think sometimes when we have so much going on with us externally, it 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 messes with us internally, right? Not just with our minds, Definitely. but physically and, and our health. Um, so yeah, yeah, welcome everybody to our Hopeful Hearts podcast. Um, just before I go forward, because I, I do have a lot to say and a lot going on. I just want to welcome you if this is your first time listening or watching us. Um, and also just to let you know that you can find out more about us. I know that we'll say this at the end, but if just so you know, um, go to our website, hopefulheartsministry.org. And we um, aid in the long-term recovery of survivors of abuse and trauma. Um, so we help in many different ways. And when Tamara and I choose to do these different podcasts, I will admit that, you know, she and I are both survivors and thrivers of many different things mm. in our lives. Um, and, you know, it just so happens that, you know, different aspects can affect us daily and sometimes that's when we go hey we need to talk about this and right. we we choose not to necessarily share everything with one another although I will consider her not just my be a best friend yeah. but like a true sister um, yes. but I won't share with her to keep it for this so that <laughs> I could have her true true yeah. initial response because I think sometimes we'll do that during I'm the like, week it's like we need to tell you something <laughs> but I have to wait so we can record it <laughs> <laughs> I know because it's like if I start talking to you and then it's like uh -huh. oh but I wish I want you to say oh. that again because I, somebody needs to hear that and then it's like what did I say I don't even remember what I, I said <laughs> but anyway so and then another thing I want to say because what I what I do have to say today is pretty um hard for me, um, it's, it could be hard to listen to. And so I just want to kind of put that disclaimer out to everybody um, that, uh, you know, maybe young ears aren't the way to go listening right now or watching. Definitely. And also, um, you know, this very well could be a trigger response. Like you may be triggered by something I shared today. Um, I, I don't ever go into the thick of the weeds and anything. I don't talk about anything no. that should be directly triggering. Mm -hmm. It's just the overall content or what I'll be discussing mm -hmm. very well could trigger. So I just want to put that out there. Um, so what there's kind of two aspects of what I would like to go into today, and that's the generational bondage of what mm -hmm. can happen within a family when there's been trauma um, induced by a family member. Yes. And how that can look and how that can affect a family. And then uh, with, th with that and what kind of led into this is um, I found a letter from my grandfather, who is my first abuser. Um, I was, uh, there was incest in my family. Um, and I'll explain more when I go into the letter. But at one point in my life, I was trying to understand everything trying to really mm -hmm. get an understanding of how could he you know why would he you know I loved him this right. is the man I loved mm -hmm. and I, I adored him he was funny and and um and he was my abuser but and, and as an older woman uh, as an adult woman I could not remember at this time when he wrote this letter I did not remember all that he had done to me I knew right. he had, but I just didn't remember and mm -hmm. um so I want to go on this aspect of when you confront 
your abuser and what is our expectation behind that and maybe what the reality is versus what you think could or should happen. Mm -hmm. Um, So just so everybody knows that those are kind of the two aspects of what we'll Mm -hmm. be discussing today. Mm -hmm. Um, And then finally, before I say my news, um, sometimes Tamara and I laugh, maybe at the most inappropriate moments. (laughs) Um, And, you know, and I was talking to my therapist uh, uh, the other day and I laughed and he was like, no, that's just your response of an uncomfortable moment or just it's what our bodies do when we are Mm -hmm. uncomfortable about something. But also Tamara and I laugh a lot just because we can also see the absurdity in a lot of things right now. Yes. When you've gone through so much of healing, when you, when you've come to a certain place, you can finally go, you know, Mm -hmm. like you can laugh about certain aspects of life, even though. Yeah. All right. Um, with that being said, um, so I know if you follow me, maybe on Facebook, uh, you have already seen this, but I unfortunately, I don't want to cry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I lost my brother uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> yes. And um, I'm, it's not something that I'm shocked by <clears throat> right um but still it's like when it happens it's shocking or it's it's mm-hmm. just a jolt right to your system my brother would have been 55 august 15th and <clears throat> he unfortunately passed from ultimately complications of type 2 diabetes um mm-hmm. but he was also a meth addict Yes. And, um, and what I, and when, when he passed, I mean, thankfully at that point, then most of the family had come back, had seen him. He was moved into a, um, living facility, a retirement home, if you will. Um, Mm -hmm. but he had lived a good part of this last year homeless, um, from his own doing from his choice. I mean, and there's a lot that I could say to that. Um, Mm -hmm. But what I think kills me in this is that, um, you know, he, my brother was a product of this generational stuff that was going on in my family. Right. And, you know, his own father, he, you know, as a little boy, I don't think that he ever acknowledged what he went through as a little boy, my mom, mm-hmm. he and my older sister, my half brother and sister, and mm-hmm. their father uh, was in the Marines and he was, God bless him, served our country. And he did three tours in Vietnam. And mm-hmm. um, when he came back, uh, as you all know, Vietnam, well, Vietnam, Gulf War, like all the war, I mean, they all do a number yeah. on our wonderful right. young men. Right. And, um, and but I, I think don't know he, anybody I mean, that came back from Vietnam. No, not changed unsafe. in some way. Yeah, completely yeah. changed. And and he did have some. I mean, his parents. His parents always remained in my brother and sister's life. Um, but he, I guess their father, their biological father, had some mental mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. issues as well. And I and I believe that that might have run over into my brother too Mm -hmm. um but there was a lot of uh abuse that happened when my brother was really young and that's why my mother divorced him um Mm -hmm. because you know he would have these moments of flashbacks and you know they Mm -hmm. weren't who he thought they were and all that kind Mm -hmm. of stuff so my mom then met my dad not long after that and my dad was marine as well but my dad never actually served in Vietnam and he served during that time, but just, he was an officer and he did everything in California. So uh, my dad adopted my brother and sister at a young age because their biological father, um, and, and this, you know, he knew that he, I mean, he knew what was going on and that's what makes breaks my heart for him is that, you know, he couldn't help, you know, what mm-hmm. was going on and and I and he knew that my father would be a 
you know, what we all thought would maybe be a better father, but in hindsight, maybe not. I mean, we had, my father had his own demons to deal with. Right. Um, and so with that being said, um, when my brother was very much about my mom's side of the family, just trying to like find his way, if you will, my brother mm-hmm. and my dad were not of the same cloth really. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, my dad loved my brother and he tried everything for him, um, Mm -hmm. enabled him way too much, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. And my brother, you know, loved my dad, but my brother just, I think there was an aspect growing up that my brother just was always seeking, always trying to find Mm -hmm. who he was, I think, if you will. Yeah. Ultimately, I'm sorry, I will get to my whole point of this, but, um, it's okay. He... He loved uh, my grandfather, my mom's dad very much and all Mm -hmm. our uncles. My mother was one of five. She was the only female. Okay. And as you all know, my grandfather, um, you know, he's a pedophile. I mean, he liked little girls. I don't know how else Mm -hmm. to say it without being too triggering. Um, And he abused my mother from the age of two to 10. And then later he did, well, he got all of this. Um, you know, and, um, when it all came out into the open, and did he abu- uh, abuse your brother as well? No. So it was no, only just females. girls. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so like, he never, mm-hmm. my grandfather never did anything to his sons mm-hmm. like that. So yeah. his sons never had any idea, obviously that this was going on. And so when my mother came in, out into the open about it, mm-hmm. To, you know, because I do have another, I mean, I have other cousins or you have other, um, you know, it, 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 it did, it did tear the family apart. And I know people listening are contemplating whether or not that they should tell their family, you know, about this Mm -hmm. one family member that did such and such, or, um, you know, confronting the, um, abuser and, Ultimately, I think that it's it's a case by case scenario that you it have is. to work out with your therapist on it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so important to go through what your expectations are, what is your reasoning yeah. behind it. Um, but what I what I truly say is that, and I know my mother would agree, um, it's so important to have your voice. I mean, that's why yes. when I founded Hopeful Hearts Ministry, um, our kind of one of our taglines is Mm -hmm. I have a voice because when you've been abused or through trauma of that nature, often you're, you're left to never be able to talk about it or never be able to share. And, (laughs) you know, I can, and I respect those that choose not to share it to their family, but I also Mm -hmm. encourage you that if like, I think it's okay to share it, like, but know what the outcome may end up being, right? So when my mother came out and she felt very strongly, like I need, I have left, I kept this way too long. Clearly Mm -hmm. I should have spoken up because now it has hit my own children. Right. And she has to carry that, that it got all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so from that point, then she was like, I'm not keeping quiet anymore. Like that is now a guilt or a shame that I have to carry, which God bless her. I don't all of, you know, yeah. forgive her and she doesn't need yes. to carry that. But that's what led her to finally go, look, I need everybody to understand this is what yeah. happened. And this is what he did. Mm-hmm. And uh, my brother had a very difficult time with that as, as also did my uncles. And because they didn't mm-hmm. know him they didn't in that, that way. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And my grandfather, I need everybody to understand, he was a good looking man. He was funny. He, um, I enjoyed him. I mean, I loved yes. it when they came to see, you know, to see us, even, mm-hmm. even though he had abused me at a young age, they, he always stopped right. at a certain age. And so mm-hmm. then you were fine after that. Right. Um, and, you know, and I, I can absolutely understand why my brother, could never accept it or, mm-hmm. you know, he couldn't and he in, that with the person he knew. Right. Right. And so, you know, you just take that and you just take some 
I mean, just a whole gamut of things. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. just to, just to close it off with my brother, I just, you know, he struggled with his own demons, never, never talked about it, never got therapy, didn't have any kind of faith. I would talk to him about praying for him or have faith. Every time I said I'd pray for him, he would say, quit praying for me. Something bad's happening. You know, (laughs) every time you pray for me, something bad's going to happen to me. And, and, um, you know, I I tried, I tried. And now I know that, that the Lord has him and he's not hurting anymore. And, uh, I just, you know, it, it is hard. Um, but Mm -hmm. I, it was, a a week or two before he passed that my mother came for my um, son's one of my, my son's graduation from college. And she brought mm-hmm. with me a letter that my grandfather had written me. And so this is what I, I mean, I had contacted you. I was like, Oh my gosh, we need to do and a podcast on this. Is this the first time you'd seen this letter? No, I mean, I, this okay. is my letter. He gave it to me, but I just, okay. I don't know why my mom had it. My mom has yeah. The original, maybe I just gave it to her. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, and I, I didn't know if maybe knew... she'd been holding on to it for a long time. And no. or no, she yeah. said this is what's kind of cool. I mean, I say cool. Cool about it is, um, it <laughs> fell out of a folder. Oh, like yeah. yeah. And I had been looking for some of this correspondence with my grandfather mm-hmm. just because I felt like it would be helpful and on yeah. a podcast like this. Right. Um. So anyway, I just wanted to share this and I'm going to, I'm going to have everybody kind of understand. So the reason why I wrote my grandfather, the date of this letter is May 31st, 1996. And when we found out, when I say we found out, when my mother came forward and started talking and telling that, you know, what happened and then my sister Mm -hmm. came out and all of this. Mm -hmm. That was, that was in, uh, September of 92. So this is mm-hmm. four years later. Okay. And at this point, my mother had, you know, so we were all dealing with what we were dealing with. Yeah. I was engaged to be married. So I was preparing for a wedding that was supposed to be July 6th of that summer. And I was, this was a huge red flag for me and anybody Mm -hmm. listening, let me just, I'm going to call this out. If Mm -hmm. you're engaged to be married and you're, um, have a thousand red flags, maybe you just need to put it on hold, (laughs) get the therapy that you need. That's just from personal experience. But, um, I was in therapy a thousand. I feel like even one red flag, you might just even one red flag. Hold on just a second. (laughs) Right. I mean, so if I, if I put all this in context, you know, God, I mean, I will never go back and and regret any aspect of my life because I had good times and I have two beautiful children. So I will say that I don't ever regret any, any aspect of my life. However, if I were to have a redo, I would rethink some things. Do you know what I mean? I do. And so here I was in therapy, the year I was getting, I was engaged. And I was, no, I was depressed, mm-hmm. depressed. And I couldn't figure out, like, I, I just, I, I really, I, I was like, I didn't want to get married. I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how to get out of it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I was afraid and I knew I wasn't where I needed to be. I was supposed to be happy and excited. And, mm-hmm. and I was not at all. And, um, i then thought, well, this has got to be because of what's going on with my grandfather and my mom and, you know, her family's not even talking to us and whatever. I was just trying to figure it out. And I just needed to understand what was going on with him. I don't know. It was just like, I needed to have an understanding of why, why, Mm -hmm. like, why do you do something so disgusting? Mm -hmm. Why do you, why are you sick? Right. Yeah. And I wrote him a letter. I wish I had the letter I wrote him. I don't have the letter that I wrote him. Um, <clears throat> and I, at this moment, had not acknowledged the fact that he had done what he did to me. I, at this moment, was just dealing with the fact that I had been raped in high school and raped in college. 
I knew in the inner being of me that something had happened, but I, in emotional mental state, could not, maybe had I dealt with it at the time, maybe I would have put the mm-hmm. wedding off. I don't know. Who knows? But I, my memories fully did not come back until about another 10, 15 years later. One second. <laughs> so, um, this was my grandfather's response to what I wrote to him. Dear Shannon, maybe this letter will come as a surprise to you, seeing as you have not heard from your old grandpa in quite some time. I have had your thank you card and its message sitting on my desk all this time. So that thank you card had to have been from before I even like knew what he had done, right? Mm -hmm. Because I know I didn't write him any thank you cards for (laughs) anything after this. Um, I know that it is hard for you to believe that your grandpa could do the things he had done when he was a young man. (laughs) So there's at least acknowledgement. I know that they were wrong when I did them, but could not control myself in those days. Now, let me just, I'm going to stop occasionally throughout this letter. Mm -hmm. My grandfather did it from when, until he was an old man. So already Mm -hmm. he's lying. I'm just yeah. okay and he doesn't acknowledge all that he did he just acknowledges only what was told mm-hmm. only what was only the fact that my mother mm-hmm. and my sister came forward and that's it right. he goes on i loved your mom very much just, again this may be a triggering moment for some i loved your mom very much but could not control that desire to do the things I did. I still love your mom very much and do not blame her in any way for what she finally did about the problem that bothered her all these years. (laughs) I'm so glad he doesn't blame her for coming forward and telling the truth. He had been sexually assaulting her. Correct. He goes that was on good to of say, him. Sorry. Right. <laughs> right. Huh. I would guess. <laughs> I would guess that also having myself involved with Dusty, who's my sister, for a short period of time <laughs> was the final blow that pushed your mom over the edge. Involved with. Really? He was involved, involved with, with. Uh-huh. his granddaughter. Uh-huh. And that, okay. oh, well, you know, just finding that out. Oh, that pushed her over the edge. Oh, so, you know, right. she kind I guess she had to say something. Right. Right. Seriously. If you guys are listening to this on podcast, go ahead and watch <laughs> this on YouTube because you'll see all the faces we make during these long bits of silence. Sorry, this just makes uh-huh. my blood boil again. Um, okay, he continues. I <sighs> here's another lie. Mm-hmm. I have not done any such thing since Dusty, and have finally recognized how wrong I had been. I still love all my children and their children and my great grandchildren. He goes on to say, I hope that someday you will forgive me as I still hope your mom and Dusty will. Plus, Now, here he contradicts himself. Right. Right. In this last paragraph, he says, oh, it was just your mom and your sister. Uh And I haven't done anything since. Uh Now he says, I hope that your mom and your Dusty will forgive me. Plus anyone else that I have offended by my earlier acts. Oh. And I'm sure that maybe he meant that to read, oh, if I offended, you know, your family or right, you know, like, whatever. But right. I'm certain that, Ooh. I mean, I'm certain, I, I, I don't even, ugh. anyway, he continues. Mm-hmm. You would think that's enough. Um, I hope that your forthcoming wedding 
will be a wonderful day for you and your groom and that in your married life, you will both find the happiness that we all long for. In spite of all your problems, your grandmother is still hanging in there with me. And that is a great tribute to her. Um, everybody, I'm going to stop. And he has one more sentence and I'll read it. But I had a harder issue dealing with forgiving my grandmother than I did with my grandfather. And maybe we discussed this possibly in another podcast, but my grandmother knew even what he was doing to my mother. And there's going to be a lot of this in a lot of people's history because the yeah. thing is, oh yeah, I'm not going to list excuses for her. I'll say maybe what she thought, and I won't accept it as an excuse. I'm just going to say some things that I heard that still right. piss me off. Mm-hmm. Excuse my language, but um, there's multiple things. So my mother was the only daughter, right? She. Right. And my mother did not get along because she blamed my mother for stealing her husband as if my mother, as a two-year-old, could possibly right. but she do brought something that on. like that. That she brought it on. A little hussy. And so then my two-year-old gr- hussy. <laughs> oh, Just, no, I, I know. Seriously. It's the absurdity. Ooh. Again, right? The absurdity of their thought process of their mindset. Mm -hmm. Um, And so to me, she's just as sick as he is, or she was just as sick as he is. Um, You know, and he would, she would blame her. She would, she hated my mother. She hated my mother and did not make life uh, good for her at all. So when my grandmother passed away, she died of diabetes, type two diabetes also. Um, my, you know, no, we didn't, I didn't go to the funeral. I mean, I was in a, I was mm-hmm. actually, she passed mm-hmm. after I got married. Um, probably just a few years after this letter was sent to me. Um, you know, and gosh, there's so much I want to say in this in regards to like, yeah. oh, so should she be commended that she stayed in this marriage with right. this stick? gentlemen that keeps ruining right. little girls lives, mm-hmm. you know or what a loyal gal know. she I, was right and I bring that up just because like I was confronted this weekend at a wedding from somebody that found out that you know I got divorced and and by all means I'm going to say this my ex-husband didn't do anything like that so I, I yeah. do want to put that yeah. out there he, he's a good man yeah. we just definitely weren't meant to be married but, and we were very volatile to each other. We were, yes. there's no doubt about yes. it. He and I were very verbally abusive to each other. We had our own types of abuse right. that we dealt with, but it had nothing to be mm. in, in this gamut at all right. by any means. But I was made to feel like, oh, so shunned and shamed because right. like you were a terrible I didn't person stick because you it left. out. Mm-hmm. Right. You left your marriage. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that you should stick it out, right? Stick it out, Mm -hmm. just stick it out. No. And, and I do believe that there's a lot that we can work through and that God can definitely overcome so much, Absolutely. but uh, no offense, but something, especially of this nature is not, it's just not, I just can't even fathom like having a child in my, uh, like the fierce love that I have for my children and like i know how crazy i have gone on like in my mind in my heart for people that are just just maybe just ugly to my kids um i can't fathom knowing that they were being abused and not only like just letting that happen, you know, protecting them, but, but blaming them. I can't, like, as a parent, that is, it is unfathomable to me. Mm-hmm. I just, I can't, I can't, I can't. And I don't think, so... yeah, I, mm. Yeah, that just the the end of the letter is just, you know, normal. I mean, 
our, right. again, our abusers are not monsters. He ends with, I'm very proud of you and all the things you've been able to mm -hmm. accomplish already in your young life. Keep up the good work, Shannon. I really do love you. Love, mm -hmm. Grandpa Lori. Um, and he did love you. He did love you the yeah. best. Yeah. Like that. He loved you in the only way he knew how. And, mm -hmm. um, and he was probably very proud of you. And, um, because like you said, they're not, they're not total monsters are abusers, um, in life. They are real people. And it's very hard for, for us to, for anybody to, to make that reconciliation between, I love this person. I hate what they did. I hate what they're doing, you know, and how do we break that cycle? I think that's, you know, that's what it comes down to with a lot of what we do with Hopeful Hearts Ministry and how we're trying to encourage people. And how do we say for someone like your brother who was privy to this information at some point, and mm. like you said, he had his own demons, but how do we break a cycle, the generational cycle, the generational hurt there to where the sins of the father are not passed down over and over and over and over, you know, that, that damage that goes, you know, even, even if it hadn't happened to you and your sister, you know, you were still affected because of the damage that was done to your mother, the horrible mm -hmm. brokenness of her relationship with her mother and her father, you know, that, was going to leave, you know, that sin had consequences that would have fallen on y'all, even if you hadn't experienced the abuse, but you mm -hmm. did experience that abuse. And so that leaves but consequences it, that like fall out for your kids, right. you know, and, and so right. you know, how, how do we break that? Right. While still it saying, did affect me though. I love that. But yeah. It it not only affected me because he literally physically abused right. me. Right. Like you said, had I not even been abused mm -hmm. by him, it right. did affect me because mm -hmm. it formed my mother in such a way that my mother right. didn't know how to nurture. She right. didn't know how, you know, she was, I love, I, I don't doubt, I think of, we've shared, I've shared this before. I don't doubt mm -hmm. the love that my mom has for me and had right. for me growing up, but she mm -hmm. could not, she was not a hugger. She was not a yeah. lovey dovey mom kissing you all over taking care. You know, yeah. she was a, you know, deal with it kind of thing because I mean that it's what she knew. She did the best she could, you yeah. know, she didn't treat us the way her mother treated her, which is a good thing. Right. Right. I mean, um, she really did. And she really did think that she was keeping us safe. So, I mean, that generational curse or you mm -hmm. know, bondage that could happen is, is so intertwined. And right. I think that's why it's, it was so important for me to share that letter. I've had people I've worked with, with hopeful hearts, um, you know, be at this kind of state where it's like, either I need to share this with the rest of my family because my views are still alive. And there are others that could mm -hmm. be, you know, caught up yeah. in that. But then there's, you know, so, you know, there's the, that fear of, but do I lose my family? You know, how is mm -hmm. there, you know, what happens after that? And so I just right. felt it was important to share this, that there's, there's no right or wrong answer. I wish that, I mean, in, even if I was working with you one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. I would never be able to say, mm -hmm. This is what you're going to do. And yeah. this is what's going to happen. Right. right. Um, I can assess the whole story and in, in the back and forth and then really try to figure out what is, what is it that you are wanting from this? You know, what is it mm -hmm. that you, what's your expectation? Right. And then we have to turn that expectation around because nine times out of 10, your expectation will never happen. So then how right. would it feel? if you don't get what that expectation is, yeah. right? And then at that mm -hmm. point, you can make your own adult decision as to which way to go. Um, yeah. But I also think it's important to share this because 
as you're discerning this aspect, or maybe y'all are going, you know, I say y'all, I'm speaking to you as a wide yeah. audience. Right. Maybe y'all are going through this. Maybe, um, you know, maybe somebody like in your family, you realize has done something and you're seeing the effects, like you're seeing what it's done to your cousins or your, you know, yes. whoever. And, you know, how is it that we can all collectively bring healing and stop this, this right. generational curse? Yes. Um, I think one thing you know, first that I, I do want to, I want to put out there and I know, I mean, just for the sake of saying it, you know, as we talk about making a decision about what, who you confront or who, you know, don't confront or who you tell or you don't tell. I want to be clear that if you know that someone is being, that especially a child is being abused in any way, you have to speak up. You have to tell. Yes. Uh, yes. You have to get police. You have, you have to protect a child. You have to. There is no excuse for not protecting a child that is in, in an abusive situation. There is no excuse. So I'll, I'll, we'll put that out there. Just mm -hmm. cover. Oh, I'm glad you did because that is, but, that is important. I yeah, mean, because by all means. But that's the thing and that, that we're talking about here is because an adult didn't speak up for you in that situation mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. because because adults don't sometimes speak up for the children that's why we have so many heartbreaking stories on the news of you know children being murdered and it it's devastating because someone doesn't speak up there's no excuse for not speaking up but what we're talking about more here is just okay so now this thing happened in our family. This thing happened in our, in our church. This thing happened in our, you know, neighborhood, whatever. How do we confront? How do, who do we tell? Um, because like you said, there's no formula for this. There's no, mm -hmm. you know, what works for you may not work for me. What works for me may not work for, you know, another friend or another family member, whatever. Um, I think, like you said, you have to, you have to figure out first, what is my expectation here? What do I want mm -hmm. from this? Mm -hmm. We've said many times on this podcast, we've said it many, many times in, you know, speaking to people that the enemy wants us to keep our secrets in the dark because mm -hmm. that's where shame lives. Shame lives in the secrets. So when we can bring stories to light that's where healing lives you know shame exists in the darkness and healing exists when it's brought to the light um but it gets messy when you bring it to the light mm -hmm. it gets really messy because um there you can tell your story and you can tell how someone participated in your story but you, know, you don't know your grandfather's story. You don't know mm -hmm. what happened to him. And I always want to believe that someone that does that kind of sick abuse, that it had to happen to him. Oh, you I know, believe. I, I mean, I don't it's, know. For it's not natural, but at, the, so. but at the same time, I think sometimes I think, you know, demons, the devil, what, you know, can get a hold of people and just make them sick um, mm -hmm. for some reason. So it's not always a generational thing, but usually I think it is. But I think that's, again, we have to confront that and bring it to the light so that it doesn't continue to be taught, mm -hmm. that, it's, that it doesn't become normalized in a family like that. But people don't mm -hmm. like it when their stuff is brought to light. People don't like, you know, if they're not ready to face it, if they're not ready to stop their behavior or they're not ready to, you know, to be called on it, then they don't like that. Nobody likes to be, you know, for all their junk to be brought to light. And especially if it's junk like that. And so mm -hmm. it's very common 
for abusers when someone brings their story to light. It's very common for abusers to go into kind of a re-abuse situation by denying, by saying you're a liar, or by doing what they can to try to tear you down and make you seem uh, like you're not credible. Mm -hmm. Now, did your grandfather do anything like that with your mom or did he just admit it? No, in the beginning, <clears throat> it took her, it took time, you know, in the beginning mm -hmm. he, she called him and he was like, you know, that was in your imagination, you know, I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and she was like, <laughs> do not lie. Right. And then my sister mm -hmm. actually went and confronted him mm -hmm. and he said, you know, I think you're, he dismissed her basically. Like, I think you're making too much out of nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, whatever I did, it really never affected you or, you know, and so they both were just dismissed. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but my mother wouldn't stop. Like my mother, then the more therapy she got, the more she, you know, really started coming out and into the light, mm -hmm. she got stronger. And she, you know, knew like, I don't want others to be affected by this. Right. Like, I don't want them to go through what I went through. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a big part of her fuel was the fact that, oh my gosh, like maybe in a way to atone for us, like to atone you know, and yeah. find that forgiveness from us. Right. Mm -hmm. And my mom started CASA child advocate. Uh, I, this may not be what it stands for, but it's like child advocate serves ad litem or yeah. something. They're the court ad litem for right. young children um, mm -hmm. that are going through CPS stuff mm -hmm. or whatever. And she started CASA of Grayson County. Um, it's been 30 something years. They're about to have a big mm -hmm. anniversary celebration and she's still on the board but she was a volunteer for them for, oh my gosh, oh, wow. like a, the normal age of a volunteer for them to be that advocate mm -hmm. is like two years because you yeah. of what you have to right. witness and hear and all that. It's and she lot. was one for, I want to say 15 years. Like she oh, did it for a very long time. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I know that I corresponded with him a few times. I remember there is another letter where he denied it. And there was, there's another letter where it's not only like he denied it, but he made a comment like, um, like they asked for it, like that my mom or my sister, like liked it or wanted it or something. And then I don't know what led up to this because I know in the very beginning, that's when all that was being done, right? When it right. was 1992 and this was 1996. Mm -hmm. So clearly at some point he finally gave in and yeah. at least now called it, you know, his sickness, but really would only, you know, pertain to the, uh, to just that simple fact mm -hmm. of my sister and my mother. But, um, yeah. And, and, and I, and I need everybody to know, like, so my uncle, like we did not speak to that side of my family for 25 years. Yeah. It was 25 years later. I say 25 years, maybe it was 20, 20, 25. Yeah. Maybe 20. Like it that. was a long, it was a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. yeah. He died at the age of 96. Wow. And uh, it wasn't until he passed that, um, that the family finally came back together mm -hmm. because the brothers felt very much obligated to take care of him, support mm -hmm. him. They knew him only as that loving guy. Right. They did not know the monster. So it was right. very difficult for them. And they didn't yeah. deny, they didn't necessarily call my mom a liar, call my sister mm -hmm. a liar or us. But yeah, it was, and to this day, they won't talk about it to this day. Yeah. I, I really hope that they watch this and listen. I hope somebody mm -hmm. in that side of the family does. <laughs> we're yeah. we're not a very close, I mean, we're just, I don't see them at all very often, but we had a mm -hmm. family reunion. But I will say that like all my memories came out at his, you know, like I said later, and then he ended up passing mm -hmm. and I went to his funeral and I, I had wanted to actually, before he died, I wanted to go con confront him. I wanted to go say, mm -hmm. you're a liar and you did do it with me. 
And um, yeah. my mom, mm. I wanted my mom to go with me. She was like, I've already been down that road. I won't, yeah. I'm done. Like, I won't do it. My one of my sister, she was like, nope, done it. Like nobody mm-hmm. would go with me. <laughs> right. Except for my, my sister-in-law. So, um, and I, you know, it's fine. I get it. So, you know, what, what was my expectation of confronting him in this? I mean, I think I mm-hmm. just so desperately needed him just to give me an an understanding because I think that's mm-hmm. my biggest problem is mm-hmm. why do people you know why do they do these horrible nasty things yeah. you know like why and I, I'll never I'll never I don't know if we'll ever get that answer yeah so if if you're looking to <clears throat> confront and get an apology if you're looking to confront and understand why you know just know that I mean I I in his mind, I guess this was his apology. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't take it as one. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, um, I, I think most people are not going to get an apology. You know, it's, mm-mm. it's very, it's very unfortunate. Most people will not get an apology. Um, a lot of people, mm-hmm. most people, sorry, will, will not even get an acknowledgement that it really happened. Um, but you have to be okay. You have to come to a place before you do it where you say, I'm going to be okay if I don't get an apology, if I don't get an acknowledgement and know that there's still power. You gain power by just speaking the truth. You gain power by speaking the truth to the person but you don't even have to do it to that person. Just, just by taking it from the dark secret places of your mind, the dark secret places where your body holds on to that hurt and bringing it out to the light gives you power there. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. you know, if someone is saying, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to confront if I can't get an apology. Well, mm-hmm. then don't confront because, you know, you, you may not, it's not going to happen. Or, or if your abuser has, has already passed on, or, you know, maybe you don't know where your abuser is, or, you know, there's all kinds of situations mm-hmm. that, that could keep you from confronting, but you, you mm-hmm. still, you still start that healing process and you gain so much strength mm-hmm. by Mm-hmm. saying it out loud yeah I had somebody years ago read my first book and then she I guess I had gone to high school with her she told me this at her 10-year high school reunion and she had read exposed and came out to her oh. uh sister about something that had happened to her mm-hmm. from a family member and that sister said for the first time out loud like yeah, it happened to me too. Then they come find out that it was like a brother too. And so find like, Mm -hmm. so by being able to speak, then they, one person speaking out, the rest of them finally came out. Right. And said, and they probably all thought they were alone. Right. And then they were able to go and and get the help that was needed. And, you know, Mm -hmm. again, the whole point of hopeful hearts and why I started it is so many people keep such secrets in the dark for decades and they don't recognize the physical aspects of what it does to their Mm -hmm. life. You know, the mental, emotional tax Mm -hmm. that it has on them. And when you can finally release that, it's like releasing the poison from the inside your body. Right. Yes. Um, But the other thing I want to say is, is, you know, the reason and and Mm. another, I mean, the main reason my mom came forward, not only because she found out it actually did, go away from outside of her. Yeah. 99%. I don't even know if that's a true number, but I'm going to just say it. Cause I believe that that's a true number. 99% <laughs> of the time. If you feel like you're the only one that has right. had something like this happen to you, that's specifically like a family mm-hmm. situation mm-hmm. or whatever. You're, you're not the only one. <laughs> 99% yeah. of the time there mm-hmm. has been right. another victim. Yes. So just, yeah, I, I agree with that. I don't, like you said, I, we don't have the exact statistics on that, 
But if, mm -hmm. if there are more people in your family than just you and your abuser, mm -hmm. you're not alone. Right. I will tell you every you know. single person in that type of situation that I have worked at with in the last almost 12 mm -hmm. years through hopeful hearts. Yeah. I could say a hundred percent that mm -hmm. it, they rec it, they either found out or acknowledged that it was, right. that it wasn't just them. Right. Right. Um, and know that when and, you speak to your family too, that the ones that, that don't know about it, that weren't involved in it, sometimes they, they have a negative reaction in the beginning. That doesn't mean that they, it will be negative forever. Sometimes it mm -hmm. just, it's shocking and they have, it takes time for them to get their brain wrapped around. Sometimes um, I, I know of a, a woman, a young woman that used to be a student of mine that had gone through terrible, terrible abuse from her father and when she finally brought this to light, uh, one of her brothers was very, very angry with her because she hadn't told before. And he stayed angry with her for a long time because it was like, I could have protected you. I could have done, you know, this. Um, she had another brother that was very angry with her and called her a liar. You know, it. you just don't know Mm -hmm. what kind of reaction you're going to get from mm -hmm. people, but I, I want to talk. Uh, right. I have a, a scenario. I mean, and again, I'm, I'm just thinking of those that maybe you're struggling with a decision mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and, and I could say a, a positive, yes, there might be a negative outcome in the sense of you may mm -hmm. not, you might have a brother that's mad at you or a sister mm -hmm. that's mad at you or, or you know, whatever right. you may not talk to certain people for a while mm -hmm. or, but think of the positive outcome of, of whose lives you may be saving and you don't even recognize it. Right. And that's the mm -hmm. key. I had somebody that had come forward, um, talking about a sibling abuse that had happened um, mm -hmm. way back when they were younger. And, you know, this person struggled with this for a long time and then finally talked about it. And the family, it was like they didn't believe this person, you mm -hmm. know? And so this person still had to go to family events and she chose mm -hmm. to, you know, she chose to. Um, but gave herself her own boundaries, gave herself her right. own parameters. Um, but the positive, even though I don't think she got the full outcome that she wanted, because I think mm -hmm. they questioned, you know, that, um, what happened was, is there's the rest of us though, that then, you know, I, you know, that they thought twice about, well, maybe I won't have that person around, you know, alone yeah. with yeah. my child or, you right. know, um, right. you know, it makes you think of another scenario of, well, maybe we just need to be extra cautious, right. you know, maybe people don't kick that person out of the family, but mm -hmm. maybe it's just maybe give others the opportunity to make a decision on their own. Right. Yes. With, I hope I'm making sense in that, but you know, I just think it's important. I, you know, and maybe, you know, on the offset that people, we all need to be, you know, very cautious all the time, but, yeah. um, you know, I don't want everybody to go overboard and be like, I can't trust anybody. You know, that's right, not right. what I'm saying <laughs> either. Um, you yeah, know, we should always not, listen to our instincts, always listen to our gut. Um, and I think that's, know, a, that's the important thing there as we are kind of running out of of time here mm -hmm. and start to, to kind of wrap this up. And there's so much, I mean, we could go on for hours and hours on this topic alone, but mm -hmm. I think one of the, the big takeaways here is yes, listen to your gut, you know, always, always listen to your gut. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing here is just know that your your story and your outcome is, is yours, but it's not going to be the same as anyone else's. Um, there is no exact formula, but it's something 
that needs to be done for your healing. You do need to, to speak out, to speak up um, for your own health, your own well-being, but also for the health and well-being of, of people around you. Um, but it's not something to be taken lightly. I think it's very, very important that you are working with a therapist on this, that it's something that you are bathing in prayer because God wants you to be healed. God wants your story to be brought to the light so that um, so that the enemy doesn't get to to tear you down in in the dark, shameful ways. Uh, God wants to work miracles in your life. And that's why God has given us people like amazing therapists and psychologists and um, you know, pastors that people that we can work with. And that is what Shannon and I are called to do. We fully believe that that this is a calling on our life is to be there for you, to be one-on-one -on -one peer support for you and help you walk through the journey of healing, of bringing your secrets into the light. And Hopeful Hearts Ministry is a nonprofit and we we do all of these these services. It's all free for anyone who needs it. Um, you can call us, you can email us, you can go to our website and contact us that way. It's hopefulheartsministry.org. Um, listen to this podcast, share this podcast with someone that that might be going through this, someone that needs to make a decision about, um, you know, bringing their, their secrets into the light. Uh, this is what we're here for. Um, I hope that you will like this episode, that you will listen to our other ones that we have on there. Subscribe to us, uh, share us with, with anybody that, uh, like I said, anybody that needs to hear what we've got going on here. Shannon, thank you so much for being so vulnerable today and sharing so much of your story. I mean, it's, it's not easy to talk about the abuse. Yeah. It's not easy to talk about people that that you love that that betrayed you but um, i just i love you and i'm so proud of you and uh you know you're just you're brave oh i love you too tamara awesome. and i'm proud of you as well thank you everybody for listening and also don't forget if you are if there's something that maybe you would like for us to discuss or talk about please do reach out um and let us know we'd be happy to 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 do that. Um, and at some point we'll even have some guests on here as well. So anyway, thank you guys. I hope yep. that you have a blessed day. Bye.